Hello and welcome to the first episode of Retro Games Dissected. Today we'll be taking a close look at Gimmick, better known in the West as Mr. Gimmick. If you have no idea what this game is, I'm happy to present what is one of the most interesting and impressive games for the NES. Gimmick is a 2D platformer that was originally released in January of 1992 for the Nintendo Famicom, but it launched with mediocre success and not the most positive reviews. Its less than stellar launch has been attributed to players having grown adapted to the 16-bit generation of consoles like the Super Nintendo and Sega Mega Drive, so regardless of how technically impressive it might have been for a previous gen title, it was still an uphill battle to stand out at the time. It also turned some players off due to its difficulty. With the bright, colorful graphics and cute character designs, people were expecting something a lot more kid-friendly, but it wound up being very challenging. And it only had a limited European port for the PAL NES, where it was renamed to Mr. Gimmick. So it came out too late, it was too difficult, and it remained relatively obscure for a long time. However, as more people learn about this game, the more of a cult following it gains. If I could nominate just one title to be known as the quintessential cult classic for the NES, I would choose Mr. Gimmick without any hesitation. A lot of fans were introduced to Gimmick by Frank Cifaldi some years back. He made an excellent annotated playthrough of Gimmick that pointed out a lot of really cool details about the game. I'll link to his original upload, but YouTube has since disabled annotations, so I'll also link to a mirror if you'd still like to see what that looked like in its original form. My mission today is very similar, to raise awareness and basically highlight the cool stuff Gimmick has to offer. As such, I'll be covering a lot of similar stuff mentioned in his video, but I'll also be adding some commentary and analysis of my own, and a friend of mine has also interviewed the game's director, so we have some more information about its history now as well. One quick warning, there will be spoilers, uh, if there could even be something that we would consider spoilers for an old Nintendo game, but what I mean is I will talk about the endings and all of the game's secrets, so just an advance warning if you didn't want to see that. With that being said, let's get started. So the premise of the game is that our hero, who is unnamed in-game, but is named Yumitaro, is given to a little girl for her birthday. The other toys appear to grow jealous when Yumitaro becomes her favorite and kidnap her and take her to the world of Gimmick. Yumitaro sets out on a quest to rescue her, and later we find out that some creepy guy with a lightsaber is behind it all. Gimmick is something of a blend of a run and jump platformer and an action platformer. There's a lot of navigating traps and pitfalls, but you also have the means to attack. You can charge up a star to throw at enemies, but you can only fire one at a time. It has some neat physics to it, as the higher it falls from, the higher it bounces. And it'll also slide down sloped surfaces. You can also collect a couple different single-use sub-weapons, but I'll talk more about the weird inventory system later. Here's where things get tricky. Your star is not only a weapon, but a platform that you can ride. Only, there's no dedicated mechanic for getting on it. You just have to land on it. And when it moves faster than you, you can't exactly just chase straight after it when you release it. This means having to do things like bouncing it off walls and catching it when it returns. You do get 10 points for landing on your own star, which really isn't much, but it's like a small pat on the back for pulling it off. This results in all sorts of crazy speedrunning potential, but the game itself does require pulling off several crazy stunts with it anyways. I mean, if you're going for the easy or bad ending, you could get by without worrying about this too much, but that's definitely not the case for the good ending. The good ending requires collecting a secret treasure from each level, and also reaching the final stage without using any continues. And considering how hard it is to get every treasure, that's going to make the not using continues part a formidable challenge. It can be hard to make direct comparisons of the difficulty, but I would put it in the same ballpark as something like a classic Mega Man or Castlevania game, or Dark Souls. That is to say, it can be very difficult and it requires patience and persistence, but it's thankfully still not quite on the level of something like Battletoads or Ghosts and Goblins, at least from my perspective. The general gameplay flow of Gimmick almost makes it feel like a puzzle platformer at times as well. It never goes full puzzle on you exactly, but to contrast it to something like Super Mario Bros., 
Those games do a pretty good job of putting you in situations that help teach you how to tackle their slowly increasing difficulty. Gimmick Instead is actually a pretty short game, it has just 7 levels. And though the difficulty does generally escalate, it feels more like a series of scenarios that you're going to be unprepared for and that you'll have to learn through more experimentation. For example, you might find what you expect to be the entrance to one of those secret treasures, and making it there is going to look impossible at first. Yes, you actually have to make it into the ceiling there. Now the game does have unlimited continues, and doesn't often send you back super far, relatively speaking, so being able to practice and learn the game without having to start the whole thing over is, thankfully, an option here. Well, Gimmick isn't a super long game, so let's just go through it. What we're going to find here is that Gimmick is packed full of weird details, and this is where much of its charm kicks in. Taking inspiration from Frank's video, most of my commentary for the playthrough will be in the form of text, as to not babble over the gameplay too much, but I will stop to discuss a few things here and there. And here's Gimmick. So one way to get extra lives is to hit these point values. And because treasures are worth a lot, and they're required for the good ending, what a good run typically looks like is building up extra lives to help avoid using a continue, with each success maybe buying you some more attempts at a later part in the game. We only start with 3 lives, but we can get a bunch more. There's also a way to farm some lives, but I'll talk more about that later. Now, getting extra lives through a point system, of course, isn't out of place for this generation of games, so this is pretty standard stuff so far. I'm pretty sure a lot of games do this, and the first other example that comes to mind is Castlevania. Something that is a little out of place for this generation of games, however, is something we can see when dropping back down below.
And here we have an enemy recessed into a tower. In most other games you'd expect it to drop bombs on you or something, but it doesn't have any attacks, so they're not even an obstacle of any kind. But they still bother to give it some unique behavior. It's the only one like this in the entire game. do a deeper dive into the sound design later, but now would be a good time to mention that Gimmick has three extra channels of audio, making use of eight channels total as opposed to the Nintendo's usual five. This allows for a lot more polyphony and a sort of bigger overall sound. Sound effects still interrupt the music in Gimmick, just as they do in most other NES games, but this usually doesn't bother us too much when the sound effects are brief. Here's an example from Super Mario Bros., where everything sounds fine in context. But if we isolate the sound channels, we can hear just how much the jump sound actually interrupts the music. The later NES Mega Man games botched this one aspect pretty badly by giving the charged up Mega Buster a loud sound effect of infinite length, and it just completely gets in the way of the music. Here's how Gimmick flexes on that issue. With the extra sound channels, it's easier to find bits of the music that are a little less vital. For the seagull sound effect, they're placing that in the first sound channel. In this particular theme, Channel 1 offers some occasional harmony, but mostly it's just a really quiet echo effect. It's a softer, delayed duplicate of the melody. So being arguably the least essential voice of the music, you can see why they picked the seagull effect to go on top of it. They really cared about the sound design of this game, and it shows. We have a soft, subtle sound effect from a generation where subtle sound effects were almost impossible due to the limitations of the audio. Okay, back to the game.
So the secret secret area isn't vital to reaching the good ending, as it doesn't have any of the treasures we need. We already got that. It's just a trove of items. But now would be a good time to talk more about the inventory system. We can only pick up three items at a time. I can scroll through which is being held by pressing down on the D-pad, and then using them is just a matter of holding up an attack, like using a sub-weapon in Castlevania. When our inventory is full, the objects remain solid, and we can jump on top of them or push them around. Now here's where things get a little weird. Pushing two unobtainable items together causes them to coalesce and turn into the game's secret fifth item, a 1-up. This can be exploited later on to farm lives, but otherwise doesn't seem to serve much of a purpose outside of a couple secret areas. It can happen elsewhere, but items that drop from enemies will eventually disappear, so it's not as easy to set up as you might think. I think the only place I've seen it happen naturally was once when I lined up a bunch of enemies from the first level on a conveyor belt. Two of them happened to drop something, and the conveyor belt pushed the drops together for me and generated the 1-up. Something else we can see here is what happens when we push an object into a corner. In a lot of 2D games, the expected outcome is that once a pushed object is up against the wall, it'll be stuck there since we can't get on the other side. But here they added a mechanic for being able to keep walking into it and slowly phasing through the object, and then it'll push back out in the other direction. It's not even remotely necessary to the game, so this is another indication that this game was someone's passion project as they clearly cared about the small details.
And here we have what I believe is the hardest part of the game. We're at the entrance to another secret area, but the stakes for this one are incredibly high, because if we screw it up and fall below, we'll hit a checkpoint. This means that we can't die on purpose in order to try again, we'd have to use a continue to get another shot, and of course using a continue will avoid our chances for the good ending. So we have one chance to get this right. So what we have here isn't the true secret area. This is instead a prerequisite where we have to pull that lever in order to get to it later. But that's not what I'm stopping to talk about. Instead, now would be a good time to explain point bonuses. In a few instances we've seen how pushing things into water is one way to pull them off. But here we can get a ton of points by using the pink subweapon to destroy the missile stockpile. It gives us 42,000 points, which is almost as much as the treasures themselves. So why are they rewarding us so much for something that's a lot easier than most other bonuses? This is because Gimmick has a point multiplier when multiple enemies are killed in a single attack. The second enemy will have its value doubled, while the third will have it doubled again, and so on. For example, we can go back to the beginning of the game and pull three enemies together. They're each worth 120 points. So the second one will be worth 240, and the third one will be worth 480. Add these all together, and we get a total of 840 points. So that's what's happening with these missiles. They're each worth 6,000 points individually, which explains the massive bonus.
So something that I'd like to stop to point out here is something I found really interesting when rewatching Frank Cifaldi's annotated playthrough. Something I apparently forgot about or just missed or something. He mentioned in his video that you'd want to carry two bombs with you to help access two secret areas. And I found this curious because I couldn't think of an example besides clearing the insect in level 3. It turns out he had a completely different strategy for this room, which I didn't even know was possible. You can use the bomb to dislodge the mechanism above, and use that to ride a cannonball to the next screen. Here's what that looks like.
So, there's something kind of strange here. There's a bug crawling the wall, and it's the only one in the game. I find its design interesting because things like spiders and other insects are usually drawn large enough in NES games to be recognizable, but here they went for something small instead. Its movement along the wall is randomized in some way, it's not just looping some predictable animation, helping it feel more alive. But what's really strange is how the game also performs an anti-piracy check here. So the bug itself might be symbolic for a game-breaking bug that will trigger here if code has been altered for pirated versions. What happens is when you reach the bug, the screen will just cut to black, and we're greeted with a really cryptic message that just says, Black Hole, while the music continues playing in the background. I find it interesting that the penalty for playing a pirated copy arrives so late in the game. It's not unheard of for PC games of the era to include subtle checks that wind up messing with your game midway through, as to make it harder for the people cracking their copyright protection to not realize they weren't fully successful. They had to have had something similar in mind here, although it means they were okay with you getting all the way to the bad ending, even in a pirated copy. This check only protects a very small portion of the game, so the developers must have felt that getting the good ending was the intended experience.
And so there we have it. Believe it or not, after all that, I still have more I can say about the game. In a future Part 2 episode, I will take a closer look at the graphics and audio. I want to explore what allowed them to work the way they did, and what interesting techniques were being used. For example, there's a lot to say about the audio beyond the fact that it simply had sound expansion. There's also some loose ends regarding the history I couldn't quite fit into this episode, so I hope you're looking forward to that as well. In the meantime, you can visit Gaming Alexandria for several articles on Sunsoft's history. That's where my friend Stefan has published a bunch of that stuff. If you enjoyed my videos, please consider subscribing and supporting me on Patreon. And as always, thanks again for watching.